You're watching Assistance in Focus with Bishop Carlos. May God bless you abundantly. It's a pleasure to know that we are going to have a couple of minutes together and we'll be able to share with you what the Holy Spirit has given to us. Without a doubt, He's right there with you. In the same way that I that I'm sure that He's right here with me, the Spirit of God is with you. And you are not watching this program by coincidence. I'm going to bring to you a very strong story. An amazing story. A story of a, a transformation of your life. When I say transformation, I mean it. Transformation in every, every aspect, every areas of a person's life. Because uh, this lady was completely destroyed. Her life was a miserable one. She was uh, fully possessed by an evil force, evil force that devastated her life uh, completely, totally. But there was a day, there was a day that she had an encounter with God. She's going to tell you her story. It might take a little bit of time, but um, um, I'm quite sure that her story will bless you. And that's the main reason why we record this program, specifically to share with you her story. All right. So after uh, we come back, when we come back, uh, I'll bring to you her story. And also, there is a... Um, a word here that I want to share with you in order to help you to remain strong in the presence of God. All right, I'll be right back right after that. I 
from Trinidad and I spoke to you that I wanted my sh story to be shared on assistant in focus why because I have given testimony Bishop about many things that happen in my life but I haven't revealed everything that is basically me who am I I kept inside of me that probably if I didn't share certain things in my life that it's okay because I am not that person anymore. But when I look at my life during this quarantine and listening to all these words and God spoke clearly and he said to me, he said, you were Jacob in the past. I have forgiven you. I have washed, I have cleansed you mm -hmm. and I have made you an Israel today. And if I have made you an Israel today, then why do you still hold on to certain things that that doesn't have no meaning in your life that you think that if you dwell back in the past and you share it with people you share it with others that they're gonna maybe think well you know how are you how they're gonna react to your behavior how they're gonna think when they see the kind of person what you have done and I keep telling myself Bishop that you know what I cannot share that part because I am gonna relive back the past this is how the devil had me I'm going to relive back the past. I'm going to be, you know, going through that pain all over again. And God said, no, you need to share. And what I need to share, Bishop, I start from here. Mm. I grew up in a home, Bishop, where at a small age I was neglected. I didn't, ha I have a mother, had a mother and father, sorry, but they weren't a figure in my life. They were never wrong. They never wanted me. So I was the biggest problem of all. I would be blamed for anything that happened. Anything, every pain that my dad caused to my mom by his abusive ways, at the age of five was my fault. And it keep going on. And my mom left me because she didn't want anything to do with me. She left me with my grandmother and my grandfather because I was the cause of her pain. And when she look at me, she see every torment that she has faced. And she hated me at those times. And growing up, Bishop, I remember 
going through a lot of trauma, seeing family die in front of me for my grandfather, falling off a stairs, dying in front of me, mm. seeing my uncle being crushed by a truck bishop, it was traumatizing. I had to endure from the age of 8 to 12, being sexually molested by someone who I thought, you know, was there for me, someone who I thought could care about me, someone who I thought, you know, was comforting me, but in it, at the same time was taking advantage. So I continued in this path. I continued as a teenager growing up in bitterness. But at the age of 12, I remember I had a lot of friends, but they were imaginary friends. And I would be playing with them, Bishop. And on this occasion, I started to play next to a hammock with a rope. And I started to wrap this rope around my neck. Playing, to me, it was a game, but it was not to them because no one can see them except me. And I wrapped this rope and I keep wrapping it, wrapping it until it started to lock my neck. And I was found hanging by my aunt. I couldn't understand it in the past, but now I knew God was there. Because they were amazed to see that I survived. I still have the scar of the cutting because the rope cut into my skin. And I was beaten for it because I thought I was trying to hang myself to make them in trouble. Same thing goes on. While growing up as a teenager, Bishop, I endured more had to come. This was just the beginning of my problem. Apart from being beaten, I was being, you know, I was being treated like an, worse than an animal, I would say. Because when they wanted to punish me for anything, like maybe when they told me to do something and I couldn't remember, I always forget most of the things because of how I was. I was forgetful. They would lock me with the dogs. Bishop, they would tie me to a tree where there were ants, so it was torture, mentally also. And I remember going to school and had to lie about my life, about the family I had. I had to lie about how happy I was, but it was my shield. It was a way I was protecting myself. I didn't want people to know. My family were taking advantage of me, my, my neighbors, everybody, and I did not want in school to be the same. So I started to lie my way through. Everything I said would be a lie, and I started to actually feel comfort in these lies. I started to believe in these lies. And I remember the age of 16, I saw back, but I didn't have an imaginary friend, a shadow. It was a shadow of a man. And I remembered that he would tell me that if you do what I tell you to do, you're going to get everything. You're going to find the happiness that you want. And I remember Bishop. I remember many times I would try numerous times to kill myself, but mm. I don't know why I didn't have the strength to go through with it. I couldn't take the torture, I couldn't take the legs, I couldn't take the abuse. My stepfather, when he's drunk, he used to beat us. We used to have to be hiding. We have to run to hide. Sometimes we would be hidden for days just for him not to see us. And my mom would be drinking, so it's like, it doesn't matter. You had no one to stand up there for you. Nobody was there. And I decided to leave home. That's the first time I decided to leave home, Bishop, uh, with my boyfriend, who's now my husband. And I remember thinking that this is my way out. I will be out of this problem. I will be free from it. But I was going into something much worse. While living home with my boyfriend, after a few months, I found that I was pregnant. And his drinking started to be worse and worse and worse. He started to neglect me. He started to go out with friends. He would never hit, but he w wasn't there. He wasn't there when I needed someone. And I started to see the shadow once again. Mm. And while I was pregnant, what I would do is he would speak to me, but he would let me do wrong things, but in a nice way. So I would feel comfort in the wrong that I did. I remember the, at six months I was pregnant. And I remember taking the rolling pin and hitting my belly so hard that it had marks right through. That is my way I wanted to kill the baby and thinking maybe I will die in the process. That didn't work. I took a knife, tried to stab myself. Probably if I send the knife through, you know, my baby and my belly, probably both of us would be dead. I don't know why something said stop. 
today I understand that was the voice of God. Once again, stop, don't do it. And I just dropped the knife. My problem started in the same way until I realized I had to make, you know, I had to be strong. For me, I believe that is how I had to be strong. Because these voices in my head, I couldn't, I couldn't understand what, what was going on. Why was I so depressed? Why was I so sad? Why was I so bitter? And my husband now, my boyfriend who I end up marrying, my husband, is I started to beat him, Bishop. And I started to beat him because I believe in what I was hearing. From at those time, I thought it was my friend. Which was the shadow that everybody wants to know well, who I was talking to. Who is that person? And he would tell me, you know what, you beat him, you are strong. And Bishop, I had a strength I couldn't explain where the strength came from. I couldn't understand why I was so strong. I was miserable, but in the same way, strong. Mm. Why was the strength there? And I remember I used to beat him, Bishop. And I would do that to protect him, but I would hit him when he was drunk because I knew he couldn't defend himself. And I would love to see blood. I remember loving to hold, to play with blood. It was a joy. And I had to get a zeal somehow. If I didn't chop my husband, I had to cut myself, Bishop. I had to cut my wrist. I had to stab myself, but I had to see blood. The voices in my head just started to escalate, Bishop. I couldn't, couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't take it. And I was like, you know what? I have to do something. Sometimes I would take bottles. I would take wooden spoon. I would take anything and I would start to hit my head for these voices to stop. Stop because these voices were telling me to do so much are wrong. And I, want, mm. I was doing it, but I was a slave to it. And I wanted it to stop, but I couldn't stop it. I couldn't stop the cutting of the hand. I started to overdose myself with tablets. I drank 30 tablets per day. Going to the doctor, my heart collapsed twice. They told me the third time I wouldn't be that lucky. When I reached the hospital, they said they had no way of survival for me. I was a lost cause. I was still, they dis still decided hospital protocol to carry me into theater for scraping and they did what they could have. But my body was mm. rejecting blood was ejecting the saline so they realized I couldn't make it I remember shaking shaking non-stop when they placed me on the corridor and said leave her they cover her but one of them said she's not dead they said oh believe me she's not gonna make it for the morning cover her with two sheets because she's shaking tremendously and Bishop it had no AC there to say well you're feeling cool but my body had two pints of blood and a little more so I was I had no kind of blood in my body anymore and while I was in the corridor I could remember seeing a dark the same dark shadow said well I come for you now I was the one with you all the time so I was like where you carrying me so it's like I'm taking you with me and I was like oh god no I don't want to go I don't want to mm -hmm. I have my son at home I don't want to go and at that time I just fell unconscious to my, to the doctors are me sorry, I was awoken the next morning and I was alive. They couldn't believe it, so they decided to ward me. I remember after all his bishop coming out, he will say, well, you know what, I will change. But my life took a turn for the worse again. I started to be worse than where I was before. Apart from cutting my hands, I started to beat my family. Bishop at, at 15 minutes past 12, Every night, I would see my husband calling me out. To me, it was my husband, but it wasn't really. And I would follow him, and when I do catch myself, I was in the middle of Norway. I was in the middle maybe of the road. Sometimes I was in the middle of a cane field. What I was doing there, I didn't understand. I came home, and when I look on the bed, my husband was drunk and asleep. I was tormented like this for nights. Trying to sleep, I couldn't sleep, Bishop. I would see my house closing in on me. 
I felt suffocated. I was awake, but yet I was not peaceful. With the lights on, I couldn't sleep. I was terrified because I started to hear these voices that would tell me, kill every one of them. You need to kill your mother. And it wasn't one day, it was every day. It's constant, daily. You need to kill your mother. You need to kill your husband. You need to kill your son because he's sick. There's no way out for him. When you kill them, you're going to see. Your life will be in peace. They are your problems. And when I would go out in the morning, and I would look at them, Bishop, their face were completely changed. They were like beasts. And they were, they were, how should I say, imitating me. They were making fun of me. They were provoking me. And I would get so angry. I would get so angry. I would just at the time want to pick up anything. Mm. And at the time I would just feel like, you know what, this is it for them. I need to kill them. But I would tell myself, I'll do it in the right time. I need to plan this properly. I was premeditating on how to kill all of them. And the voice, and from the voice, from the shadow, sorry, he started to be with me, he started to go where I was going, and he would help me. When they realized, well, something was wrong with me, my mother said, no, something is wrong with this girl. Because the night prior to that, my husband was drunk and he was talking to me as normal. I was going crazy. I was seeing things that I'm not supposed to see. I was seeing people who were there that it wasn't even there. I was talking to the guy that he said was my friend. He was my comforter, but he wasn't. I remember I mm. needed help until I decided that I am, you know what they said, you need to go to the psychiatric clinic. And I started to be an outpatient clinic in Shogunas. I started to go there, but nothing couldn't help me. Because when I go there, he would be sitting with me and he'd be like, I would be like, you see what I tell you? This is what I tell you. Do understand us. And the psychiatrist would be like, who are you talking to? I was like, he right here. You can't see him. She's like, madam, it's you alone. I was like, no. You, so you're telling me I'm stupid. He's right here. And he would and he'd be telling me, you know, let's get out of here. It's like, yeah, let's get out of here because they don't understand. And I would hit away everything and walk out. That was my life. A life of torment, Bishop. A life where I catch myself digging grave at midnight to bury my family. This was me, Bishop. Until on the 7th of March of 2011, I came into the Universal Church out of fear of being admitted to sentence. That was one of the big psychiatric hospitals. Mm. I didn't want to go, so I just came to the church. When I came to the church, I said, you know what, my son is already sick. Because he was born with cerebral palsy. He had a lot of complications. Just like, you know what, I'm just going to come here. Let me see if they could help you. Because they can help me. I don't know who is Jesus. I don't want to know who is Jesus. I don't care. And I remember listening to the words. And I saw the pastor in front. And I was like, I had a hatred towards this man of God. I didn't want to hear him. When I heard the name of Jesus, my head was exploding. I couldn't understand what was going on. I didn't want to hear. So when they speak about the Holy Spirit, Bishop, no way. I couldn't stay. I had to run. I was out of there. But after seeing one night what made me come back to the church mm. is after I tried, Bishop, I realized I had no control over my body. My hands, I would take up glass, break it, and cut my wrist. But although I want to stop it, I couldn't because I had no control over my hands. My feet, I couldn't move as I like. I was being controlled now. And one night, I took a pillow and started to suffocate my son. And it's then I kept myself and was like, and I heard again for the second time in my life. I could remember that. Hey, and doing wrong and hey, and stop. But I remember asking and calling out on the name. I said, Jesus, please help me. And it will just go away. I keep on fighting. God has made healing. My son has been totally healed. My marriage was broken. My marriage is transformed. And I remember a voice saying, I have given you everything that you ask. What about me? And this voice just keep 
this word just keep going to my head and I remember this talking about the Holy Spirit how I need how you need the Holy Spirit you need the peace because I had everything but still I didn't have the peace mm. and I remember I decided to do a campaign of Israel to go strong not only money to sacrifice financially but to sacrifice you know getting up and praying I started to challenge myself going out to evangelize going to the health centers I didn't need anyone I took my flyers and I go ahead and I started to challenge myself because I wanted to receive this peace. I want to know what this peace is about. And on the 15th of December, 2013, I received mm. the Holy Spirit. That was the day of the campaign of Israel. And when I received it, Bishop, it was like something I've never imagined. I remember being in front of the altar. I was in the crowd, but I was in front of the altar. And I was just praising the name of God. I remember words coming out of my mouth. I was praising God. I was happy. I was elated. I couldn't understand this peace that was coming. I just wanted to run out and scream and just start to shout, Who is Jesus? What he is? And it just keep flowing. I was happy, but I was in tears. And I just shook those tears and I said, You know what? I still didn't understand that was the Holy Spirit until I got the confirmation. God said, I am with you. From them, Bishop, I've received this peace. Today I am transformed. I am happy, Bishop. I don't have the life that I had before. I don't live a life of torment, of peace. But why I wanted to share this testimony and just let you know, Bishop, I wanted to share it on assistant in focus is because I used to think that, you know what, I, I was a killer. And I know God has forgiven me, but inside of me, I said, if I share this, I would relive my past, as I mentioned in the beginning. And I didn't want to relieve that pain. But this was something I believe that the devil could have catch me with Bishop. This is the upper hand. He could have taken advantage of me. This could have been my downfall without my knowing. And God has shown me this is the piece of my life that I need to let people know. I, I give testimony about how I was in the hospital, but I ne never give the testimony about what I did to mm. be in the hospital, Bishop. And this is why today God has given me this courage because I felt so great given it. And God has given me this courage, you know what, to go ahead and share it because this is who I am today. This is the Israel that God has chosen today. And I am at peace, Bishop. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. On a daily basis, we go through many things such as working, taking care of a family, or handling tough situations. In the Bible, it says, now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This program, Assistance in Focus, was made to help us assistants as we go through our daily lives, staying connected with God and eliminating all doubts. With real life stories and messages of faith to strengthen us, helping us to remain in the presence of God. This is a moment of meditation. Welcome back. I do believe that you understood what she went through. The pain, the agony she carried in her life for a long time. In the time in which she was, when she was lost with her life completely destroyed. But you see, today, she's a woman of God. She's completely free, transformed, and principally filled with the Holy Spirit. You too can also overcome. But there is a word here in the first book of Timothy, chapter 4. I spoke uh, with the assistant here in Brooklyn, New York about it and i want to share with you in few words if you have if you got a bible on you excellent if you're not whenever you got a chance you can read first timothy chapter 4 
uh, from verse 14 that the Holy Spirit says do not do not uh, do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given to you by the prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the prophets or, I'm sorry of the eldership you see which gift is it he's talking about that we should not neglect it is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Is the anointing of God in our life. We are who we are. We do what we do. Not by uh, our own capacity. Our own wisdom. Nor by the strength of our arms. We do what we do because of the Holy Spirit, simply because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If we pray for you and you get delivered, you conquer your victory, it's because of the Holy Spirit. The souls we save is the Holy Spirit. The strength that we have, the peace that we have, the certainty that we carry inside of us concerning our salvation and yours as well is the Holy Spirit. It's not our, our own or ourselves. Many times we, we see many people uh, exalting themselves. We see them uh, being proud. Hmm? They do whatever they do, uh, and they they try, they try to take all the glory upon themselves. We know the glory of what we do, of what we conquer, is not ours, but it is. It belongs to God. And who are we? Who am I? Who am I? Who are you? To take the glory that belongs to God alone to bring it to us. We can't. We can't. This gift is the Holy Spirit that we received by, by, by the, the, the prophecy, meaning by the promises of God, by the word of God that was preached to us. And by the laying on of the hands, as it is written here, the laying on of the hands of the elders. The elders represent the bishops, the pastors who prayed for us, who prayed for me, who prayed for you. Unfortunately, there are many who have neglected this gift. They had, they had made light of it. They put it aside. They started to prioritize other things. They prioritized other, other things. They prioritized their, their personal will, their own will, their own desire. They prioritized family, job, friend, any other things. I'm not saying that they are not important. Of course they are but not more than the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And because they prioritized other things, they automatically despised the anointing of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Dear assistant, valorize, valorize the gift that you have received from the Holy Spirit, from God. If he has given to you his spirit, it's because he's counting on you to please him, to do his will by blessing others, by saving souls, by helping those who are in need of help. Principally, in these days that you see around the world, 
people are very skeptical about the future of their lives. People are afraid, very fearful because of so many great horrible things they have seen and they have heard. And God is counting on those who have received the gift of the Holy Spirit to save his souls. Can God count on you? Sincerely speaking, can he count on you? Are you available for him? Are you prioritizing the gift that he has given to you when the Holy Spirit has entered in your life? Make yourself available for him. Prioritize his will. Make him number one in your life. And he's going to make you number one in his kingdom as well. Number one in the, at your workplace. He's going to make you number one in your family, in your society, in the, the place where you live, your, your neighborhood, wherever you go, he makes you number one in everything you do, everywhere you go. But for him to make you number one, you have to prioritize his gift, his will, above any other thing. If you do it, I am sure you'll be number one in everything. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Assistance, close your eyes. It is now the moment of prayer. I'm sure you are ready. Close your eyes if you can, if you want. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, you are Almighty. You are above all things. And you hear our simple prayer, simple, but with the certainty and assurance that you are hearing it, not only my prayer, but the prayer of this assistant who is far away, my Lord, perhaps in a place where she is the only one, the only assistant in that church. But you are counting on her. You are counting on him right now. Perhaps this assistant, my Lord, is not, a, is not able to come to church because of this pandemic, because of this lockdown. She is by herself at home, perhaps in a hospital bed. But you visit her right now. You taught her life, her body, to lift her up from this, this bad and dark situation she's been in. Oh, my Father, I pray for all of them in order for them to keep, to valorize, to prioritize the gift that they have received from you. Don't let them neglect this gift, my Father, because this is not something else, but, but your spirit, your anointing that you have put on us. Ah, oh, my Father, embrace your servant right now, especially this one who perhaps was thinking to give up on everything, give up on her ministry, her anointing, her gift, her uniform, her Holy Spirit. Wake her up right now, my Lord. Oh, my, my Father, 
I bless your servant by delivering them into your mighty hands. In the name of Jesus, if you can, raise up your hand and say, My Lord, take me by my hand right now. Be with me, Holy Spirit. Guide me and strengthen me up every single day of my life until you take me away from this world or until you come back. In Jesus' name, you say, Amen. When someone makes you feel you don't exist, what to do, how to understand, it doesn't matter what they think of me, when I know that my love They can talk and despise me, my friend, my father, I am strong for all I have been through, God is present, loneliness no longer lives in me, I know I am loved, I am your child. I'll be with you until the end, my friend, my father, I am strong for all I have been through, God is present, loneliness no longer lives in me, I know I am loved, I am your child, I'll be with you until the end. Very good. Very soon we'll be back with more of your program assistant in focus. Feel free to share the link of this program with a friend. Let your friend be part of uh, part of this program as well. Watch the testimony and of course receive this prayer. All right. God is with you. Goodbye. We'll be together very soon. You're watching Assistance in Focus with Bishop Carlos.